Hello and welcome to Malinche, Pocahontas, and Sacagawea, Misremembered Interpreters and Cultural Ambassadors, presented by Bryn Quick and researched by Bryn Quick, Lydia Liu, and Vanessa Sanchez Guayasan. It's quite possible that you've never heard of Malinche, Pocahontas, and Sacagawea, or if you have, you associate them more with Disney musicals than with intercultural communication. Through this presentation, we hope to introduce you to these often sensationalized women and to give you an idea of who they really were rather than who they are remembered to have been. To begin, Malinche was a Nahua woman born near Coatzacoalcos in what is now Mexico, circa 1502. She was the daughter of a local Aztec authority, which afforded her certain economic and educational advantages. However, after her father's death, her family sold her to a group of Mayan merchants, who then sold her to a Tabascan cacique, or chief, and he in turn sold her to Spanish invader Hernán Cortés. Malinche then acted as Cortés's primary interpreter and cultural advisor during the Spanish invasion and conquest of indigenous Mexicas. Malinche had a son with Cortés in 1522, and later married and had a daughter with another conquistador, Juan de Jaramillo, in 1524. It is thought that she died in Spain in 1528, but historical records are unclear. We have no written records from Malinche herself, but the records of Cortés and other colonizers highlight the vital role that she played in the Spanish conquest. Because she had been forced into multiple culturally diverse environments from such a young age, she gained enhanced language skills. Not only that, but she needed those linguistic talents just to survive. She was also keenly aware of the rising indigenous hostility toward the ruling Aztecs, and because of this political awareness, she was able to mold the conquistador's message, including that of Catholicism, to convince the indigenous peoples of the value of Spanish domination. She seemed to have lived with one foot in each world, constantly acting as mediator between the Mexicas and Spaniards and working to convince each camp of the other's worth. Because she was so influential in both the indigenous and Spanish worlds, she was viewed differently by both groups. To the Spanish, she was the baptized converted Christian, Doña Marina, and enthusiastically accepted the superiority of the Spanish language, culture, and religion. She also worked to save the invading forces by uncovering an indigenous conspiracy against Cortes and was crucial to the conquistador's negotiations with indigenous peoples. For the indigenous Nahuatl speakers, she was Malinzin and was respected as an authority working for their benefit. They saw her actions as demonstrating a consistent effort to minimize violence and facilitate the next cycle of civilization. For them, she was a bridge between indigenous and Spanish cultures. But how is she remembered in Mexico now? Her image and story have shifted several times in modern Mexico. She has been viewed as a feminine traitor or Mexican Eve by groups that wanted independence from Spain. In the 19th and 20th centuries, she began to be used as a proud symbol of the mother of the mestizo race. In the 21st century, she's often used in feminist works and retellings of the Spanish invasion, as well as used as a major figure in the revitalization of arte indigenismo. While she is remembered differently and used for various purposes by different groups, it is clear that Malinche was a complex figure who played a significant role in a turning point in Mexican history. Nearly 100 years later, far north from Malinche's birthplace, another young woman would also be born who would signify a turning point in history. Pocahontas was a young woman born circa 1595 in what is now Eastern Virginia in the United States. Like Malinche, she was the daughter of a powerful ruler, in this case, Chief Powhatan of the Powhatan Confederacy. Pocahontas also experienced an invasion, this time by English colonizers in 1607. The colonizers built the Jamestown Fort near Pocahontas's village, and initially, relations with the Powhatan tribes and invaders were tense but friendly. Pocahontas met one of these colonizers, Captain John Smith, when she was 12 and he was 27. Smith wrote that she saved him while he was held as a prisoner by Powhatan at one point, but never indicated a romantic relationship with her. A few years later, after indigenous and invading relationships had turned violent, Pocahontas was kidnapped by Jamestown and held for ransom in exchange for political prisoners from Powhatan. However, she was never released. Instead, she was married to colonizer John Rolfe and went with him and their son to England. It was there that she died of an unknown illness in 1617. 
Like Malinche, Pocahontas played an important role in acting as a cultural ambassador and, to a lesser extent, interpreter between the indigenous and invading groups. Within her own culture, it was expected that she would help facilitate contact with colonizers because of her important position as Powhatan's daughter. It is also important to note that while Smith never explicitly wrote that there was a romance between them, his writings do hint at her having feelings for him, but this is not confirmed by any other historical writings. Any feelings he might have thought that he felt were most likely the result of a cultural misunderstanding, if they were ever there in the first place. Also like Malinche, Pocahontas was held up as an example of a savage turned civilized Christian and a good Indian who recognized the need for white domination. The colonizers also viewed her as a peacemaker when she chose to marry John Rolfe, even after they burned Powhatan villages. They then paraded her as a symbol of colonial success and dominion in the New World when she was brought to and put on display in England. However, in reality, all we really know about the real Pocahontas comes from a handful of white male colonizers' records and no first-person recorded narratives from Pocahontas herself. Like Malinche, the invaders used her as a symbol of savage acceptance of white colonization and Christianity. She too was viewed as a mother of a new race of indigenous and British peoples after the birth of her son with John Rolfe. Finally, as we are all probably most familiar with Pocahontas because of the Disney movie by the same name, it is worth pointing out again that the supposed romance between Pocahontas and Smith almost certainly never existed. But the idea of that romance reinforced white America's theme of peaceful assimilation of indigenous peoples into white European culture, which has been a useful narrative for white America throughout its history. More than 150 years after Pocahontas, a third woman was born who would be used to shape a historical narrative. Sacagawea was born circa 1788 in what is now Idaho in the United States to the Lemmy Shoshone tribe. At the age of 12, she was captured by the Hidatsa tribe of North Dakota. A few years later, she was sold by the Hidatsas to a French Canadian fur trader named Toussaint Charbonneau, and he took her as one of at least two indigenous wives. Around that time, American President Thomas Jefferson had just purchased a large tract of land from the French, known as the Louisiana Purchase, and wanted the land to be explored and surveyed by Americans. He hired Meriwether Lewis and William Clark to do just that, and they, they formed an expedition team known as the Corps of Discovery. Charbonneau and his wives, including Sacagawea, became part of this team when Lewis and Clark realized they would need someone who could speak the Shoshone language so that they could negotiate for horses when they reached Lemmy Shoshone land. Sacagawea filled this role of interpreter. It is believed that Sacagawea died at the age of 24 a few years after the expedition ended, but historical records are not entirely clear. This begs the question, who exactly was Sacagawea? The only primary source historical accounts that we have of her come from the journals of Lewis and Clark and a few other white male contemporaries. We have no written accounts from Sacagawea herself. We do know that she gave birth to a son just a few weeks before setting off on the Corps of Discovery expedition with the baby strapped to her back. We also know from Lewis and Clark's writings that she played a vital part in keeping the men of the expedition alive by using indigenous techniques of hunting and gathering when food rations ran low. We also know that she was reunited with the tribe that she was once kidnapped from when the expedition reached Sh Lemmy Shoshone land, and that she was the one responsible for negotiating with the Shoshones for horses that would further aid the expedition. Lewis and Clark also wrote that at one point, she rescued important expedition records and supplies after a raft capsized in dangerous whitewater rapids. They indicate in their journals that she died in 1812, but Several indigenous tribes oral traditions claim that she went on to live a full life among them until her death in 1884, so her fate is not truly known. We also know that Sacagawea was an extremely important part of the core of discovery, specifically for her linguistic and cultural knowledge. Like Malinche and Pocahontas, Sacagawea experienced being kidnapped and suddenly dropped into a new language and culture at a young age. She had to learn to speak the Hidatsa language and adapt to their way of life in order to survive. This meant that her ability to speak Shoshone and Hidatsa allowed her to speak to Charbonneau in Hidatsa, and he interpreted from Hidatsa to English. This three-way interpretation is what allowed the expedition to pass through Lemmy Shoshone lands and eventually reach the Pacific Ocean, thus completing the exploration. 
Interestingly, Sacagawea's presence as a young woman with a baby also encouraged indigenous tribes that they'd met along the way to view the expedition as peaceful, even if the consequences of that expedition decades later would not be. But how do we remember Sacagawea today? Much has been done over the last 120 years, particularly by white Americans, to mold her into a character that fits a very specific and often nationalist agenda. First, like Malinche and Pocahontas, she is held up as an example of a good Indian who recognized the inherent goodness of white America's policy of land seizure from indigenous tribes and the righteousness of manifest destiny. Also like Malinche and Pocahontas, she had a child with a white man and is therefore seen as the mother to a new race of people. Not only is it said that she willingly bore a white man's child, but the visual depiction of her with this child is often indicative of a Madonna and child aesthetic, likening her goodness to sainthood. In 1902, Sacagawea's story was shaped even further by the burgeoning women's suffrage movement, and white American women like Ava Emery Dye romanticized her in novels in order to highlight the importance of women's contributions to the shaping of America. More recently, her image has been used as a figure that represents the melting pot of America, thus perpetuating the lie that America as a nation has always been tolerant of non-whites. All of this means that the Sacagawea that we think we remember today is actually a tall tale and a far cry from the young woman that she probably was in reality. In conclusion, all three women, though separated by dozens or hundreds of years, have been used by invading forces in remarkably similar ways. The colonizers' misconceptions about them had lasting repercussions on how indigenous women were depicted in historical records and laid the foundation for the mythology that engulfed each woman as oppressed, exploited, and misremembered. In reality, the women had relevant and important roles in their native communities. The lives of Malinche, Pocahontas, and Sacagawea were obscured by centuries of deliberate mythic abstraction. It is vital that we begin to view them as the whole people that they were.